Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Eric, and I'm uh, privileged to bring the, the word to you this morning. Um, if you could now, at this time, if you want to follow along in your worship guide, we have our text printed there today, or you can turn in your Bible or on your phone, whatever it is that you're uh, most comfortable with. Our text today is Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. This is the word of the Lord. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished because beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Let's pray together. Well, Father God, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have to come into your word and ultimately, Lord, for you to teach us. I ask God that I would only be a vessel, but instead that you would speak to every single one of our hearts individually. Um, Lord, we know that every single person in here, every single one of us came here to the table uh, with something from this week. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us, that you would comfort us. We need to be comforted, convict us. We need to be convicted. And, Lord, that you would move us in mission towards our neighbors uh, through this time in your text. But also, Lord, move us together as a body. We know, Lord, that you have a message for us this morning from your word for Reconciliation Church. And we ask, God, that that would be clearly known to us as we seek to be your hands and feet and your mouth um, in this little corner of your world. So we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Bless this reading and preaching of your text. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I don't know if I'm the only one, but on an occasion I have this experience fairly regularly with my wife um, in which I will be doing something, um, usually, you know, I just... Um, multitasking of some kind. Maybe it's when we're maybe it's when we're making dinner. Um, maybe it's when uh, on the occasion that I play video games. For those of you that know me, you know that's a that's a joke. That's uh, that, like every day. Um, enjoy my video games, but we'll have these uh, this, these occasions in which I'll be doing something, and, and Heather will come home from work, and uh, and she'll be talking about her day, and um, as the good husband that I always am, I'll be listening intently to her. Um, and that as, as the conversation goes on, suddenly she stops talking, and, um, and I wonder why that is. And then when I look over at her, I realize that she asked me a question, and I didn't hear the question. And therefore, I am proving myself to not be the perfect husband that I believe myself to be um, on the regular basis here. Um, so when you think about this idea of listening, we want to recognize, as we're, as we're coming to this text, um, that oftentimes the issue of us listening and understanding somebody speaking to us um, is not always um, the fault of the person that's speaking. Uh, the listening itself is an intentional action. Uh, that when somebody is speaking to us, we have to actively pay attention and hear the actual words that they are saying, that communication is a two-way streak. And so this is, this is true as we understand it in our personal relationships, but this is also true in our relationship with the Lord. And so when we come to this text, I want us to understand that there's, there's a lot of interesting things that is, is, are happening in this text. So we've been, we've been going through Mark uh, since September with a, with a couple of breaks in here. Um, and so if you're just joining us, we, we're coming to chapter 7 uh, with all of the other chapters that we have behind us. Um, but we, we've already said some things about Martha. I just want us to, to catch us up on and, and have us all be on the same page. So first off is that um, the book of Mark is, a, is the shortest of the Gospels, um, and Mark is known for being very straight and to the point. 
He doesn't spend a lot of time giving details in most of his stories, but instead everything is, everything is in summary. Um, it's, a, it's a gospel where a lot of action is associated with it, and we also have a lot of, of miracles happen in this book. Uh, the concentration of miracles compared to teaching, for instance, is, is much more skewed in the direction of miracles in Mark's gospel um, than any of the other gospels. However, we also talked about how the gospel of Mark if you're, if you're not familiar with, with the Bible, there are four different Gospels that each give an account of Jesus' life. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the first three, um, and we call them the synoptic Gospels, and synoptic meaning they see in the same way. And the reason for this is because they have a lot of similar content. Um, the Gospel of Mark, 95% of it, um, is found in the other Gospels, either by almost direct copy or by allusion where they tell the same story. Um, this is one of the exceptions. So immediately when we come to this, this text, uh, this is the only gospel. Mark's gospel is the only gospel that records this story. And on top of that, um, in this story of Jesus' healing, we have him healing a deaf man. Um, this in of itself is noteworthy because most of the healings that we tend to see are him healing, healing the blind, um, healing the mute, or casting, casting out demons, or other things. But, but the idea of, of Jesus healing a, a deaf person, is, this is a rarity. I mean, deafness was, was obviously um, not rare in that, in that society, but usually the other Gospels will record this in summary statement. That they'll, just, that they'll say that Jesus healed the blind, healed the mute, healed the deaf, but an actual account of a healing of an actual deaf individual is, is a rarity in Scripture. And so we automatically come to the text with assuming that Mark is, is saying something that we need to pay attention to because it's the only, he's the only one that records this. But on top of this, I don't know if you caught as we read this story, I want us to see that there is, this, this is out of character for Mark. A lot of detail is packed into these verses. You guys notice that? So you have, you have things, for instance, the way that Jesus heals, the words that he speaks, all of this this story is very vivid. Mark is trying to say something very specifically here to us. He's communicating in a way that says, hey, we, I want you to pay attention. I want you guys to hear this. In fact, most, people, most scholars, when they look at this, would say that this is probably a detailed eyewitness account. That as, as Mark was putting his gospel together, that this was a story that maybe is for the region, that this was, this was a, a well-beloved story that a lot of people um, we had repeated over and over, and so we had this vividness to this. And so when we come to Scripture, we want to approach it from this aspect of believing that God is communicating to us, that he's communicating through these human authors. So th- today, I, I really only have one point, and we're going to take a look at, at what God says in this. But the only point is that God is speaking. Are you willing to listen? God is speaking. That's the reality of it. God's voice is going out. We see it in Scripture throughout all creation. God is speaking to you right now. The question for you is, are you willing to hear his voice? And are you willing to listen to him? So, when we look at this text, first thing that we want to see, that we're going to look at four different things that God says to us through this text. And the first one that God says to us is, come to me. Is come to me. Now, we pick up in this story. It says that Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. So now, um, Tyre and Sidon, those are, those are not cities that we're generally accustomed to, but these were the prominent city-states of the ancient empire of Phoenicia. And so at this point in, in history, this entire region is under occupation by the Roman Empire. So the Rome is in control, but each of these different regions have maintained their own cultural, um, mainly cultural and oftentimes ethnic identity. And so last year as Bapo preached, we saw that we encountered a Syro-Phoenician woman. So this is a woman from, from that region um, who was in her ethnicity, was, was is from Syria, living in Phoenicia, or was of Syro-Phoenician descent. Okay? And so the important thing there for us, as we're thinking about this, is that they're not Israelite. They're not Israelite. 
last week, again, there's a, there's a lot of unity in these, in these particular chapters and in these stories that there's an, an entire message that Mark is trying to communicate to us. Um, but Jesus had said over and over and over again that when he came to earth, who was his primary audience that he was coming to? He was coming to the nation of Israel. He was coming because the nation of Israel had the benefit, and we're told this in Romans, that the nation of Israel has had the benefit of the law and the prophets. So if you, if you pick up, you have a physical Bible in front of you, and you pick it up, um, if, you, if you turn back just a few chapters, or if you, just a few pages in your book, just about this many, you'll realize very quickly, we're right at the beginning of the New Testament, and if you look at, if you look at my Bible, do you notice how much comes before it? A ton. I think that's the actual scholarly word that they use. A ton of Scripture comes before the New Testament. Um, our Bibles are, most of our Bibles physically are the Old Testament. The New Testament is very short, is very short compared to the Old Testament. Um, all of these, Jesus says, prophesy about him. And so when Jesus shows up on the scene 2,000 years ago, he comes to the nation of Israel, not because they were his only target. And I need you to hear me on that. They were not his only target, but they were the target at that moment because they should have been ready. That he had had um, a thousand years, right? Or 1,400 years of prophecy, prophesying about a coming Messiah. And, and however, whoever knows um, how long before that of a prophecy of a head crusher. That's the, that might be weird for somebody that just went completely like weird Bible for you. So head crusher. So in the beginning of the Bible, there's a book called Genesis. And in the beginning of the Bible, um, we have Adam and Eve, the Bible says, that every single human being on earth regardless of ethnicity, descended from these two people, okay? And also, from both of these individuals, we inherit something that we call sin. And the reason why we inherit it is because as Adam and Eve, God placed them in a perfect place called the Garden of Eden, and during that time, they rejected God as God and wanted to to say, we're going to live life our own way. And by stepping out of God's authority, broke the world. And every single person that's alive today, we have inherited that brokenness. Every single one of us has inherited that brokenness. But from the very beginning, as, as Moses is penning this for us and writing this out for us, he includes this great message of hope. It says that one day, they will become somebody who will be known as the head crusher, that will crush the head of the serpent, who we know as Satan, as we know as the deceiver, the one who convinced humanity to go our own way, but that he, in the process, is going to receive a mortal wound because it says that a snake's going to bite his heel. And if you've ever been around poisonous snakes, see, so, I, so I grew up in Michigan, um, and then I spent time in Alaska. Michigan has one poisonous snake that is, like, you get bit by it and you might get a headache, okay? Um, and Alaska has no snakes. So moving down here, I had to learn what it's like to be around poisonous snakes. Um, for instance, like when you see a snake, my, so again, no poisonous snakes growing up, I love snakes. So I know that there's some of you right now that just even me talking about snakes is a problem for you. Um, I, I would chase down garter snakes, not to chase them out of the garden, but to catch them. Um, and it was a lot of fun for me. And yes, I got bit multiple times. It's not a big deal. But um, I never had to worry because a garter snake, like they eat bugs, right? I'm not worried about it. Um, but it's a very different thing for me now having three children living in this area and like knowing that we have copperheads in our neighborhood. It becomes a very different, you walk in a very different way when you're going hiking through the woods when you know that there are copperheads that could possibly be hiding in the, in the foliage there. You just walk in a different way. Um, Well, it's said that this head crusher that's going to come, he's going to crush the head of the snake, but he's going to get bit on the heel. And anybody knows that when a poisonous snake, a viper bites you on the heel, you're going to die. But it says that this head crusher is going to save all of humanity. So these scriptures, we're talking from the very beginning, and we could, and this is not today's sermon, but we could walk through every single book of the Old Testament, and we could see the gospel of Jesus Christ in it. We could see that this Messiah is coming, and this is what he's going to look like. This is where he's going to be from. These are the things that he's going to do. 
And so when Jesus comes, he's born as a Jew. He is ethnically Jewish, born to an ethnically Jewish nation, coming to them to say, I am a universal Savior. I have not come just for you. I have come for all people, all nations. Now, saying, how do you get that from this text? Well, first of all, he's in a, he's in a Gentile nation. That's the first thing that we should see. So Tyre and uh, Sidon, they are, they're basically, they're used to encapsulate this region of Phoenicia, which are not Israelites, and then he ends up in a place called the Decapolis that we see by the Sea of Galilee. Now, um, if you're familiar with the Bible, you might be tempted when you see Sea of Galilee to immediately think Israelite. Because the Sea of Galilee, that's, that's where Jesus is from. He's from Nazareth. He's, he's from Galilee. He's around that area. Um, but the Sea of Galilee is actually, um, is actually bordered by three different nations. At that time, and actually today, we still see three different nations occupying the space around the Sea of Galilee. Maybe four. I could have gotten my modern geography wrong there. But you have these different nations around it. And he ends up in a region called the Decapolis, which literally means ten cities. And guess what? All ten of these cities are Gentile cities. But what is Mark trying to call our attention to specifically about this? There are three times, I want you to hear me, three times in the Gospels where the, where the city states that Decapolis is mentioned. Um, once is mentioned in summary in the, in the Gospel of Matthew about all the different regions around that, got, that Jesus did ministry and that people came to him. The other two times are when Jesus heals a, a cast a demon out of a man living in tombs in, in, in chapter 5 and in this region where he comes to heal a deaf man. Now, um, when, you are, when you open up your Bible and you see words that, are, that you don't see a whole lot, I just want to, I want to challenge you to, to pick up your phone and Google them. Um, there's a great app called Bible Gateway. Um, it has a bunch of different versions in it, but one of the greatest things for people that with an English Bible is just search the word in, in the Bible and see what comes up. And you're going to find some really interesting things. But in this particular case, I, and again, I know this point in particular is really long. I always do this. I promise we'll pick up. Okay, so those of you that, that are wondering, we're going to pick up here. However, you need to understand the structure of this. So, in our story, Jesus heals a man who was most likely born deaf. Okay, so he's, gonna, he's healing a deaf man. But what happened right before this? Bapo preached on the healing of the Syrophoenician woman, and her daughter had a demon. And Jesus cast out a demon. But then we're going to keep going back because right before all this happened, there's a conversation with, with the religious leaders about tradition and what's defiled. And if you were a Jewish person, there is one thing in particular when it came to being holy that mattered probably above all else at that time. It's one of the distinctions that you would distinguish yourself from the culture around you as being Jewish, as being a person who follows the Lord. Anybody want to take a guess as to what that is? Food. Now, now, here's the thing. This is one of the things that I love about our vision um, in terms of as a, as a church that is multicultural, um, is that to the nations, is I know that, you know, when, when we get back into the habit, I know COVID like disrupted all this, um, we're going to have some really good cookouts. We're going to have some really good barbecues, right? So um, I don't know if you've had Toya's Chicken, um, like last, uh, two Novembers ago, so not during pandemic, pre that, um, we got together this family, and she made this, she, she said, no, I'm putting her on blast here. Um, she, had, she made this chicken, and it was some of the best chicken I've ever had, and I grew up raising chickens. Like, my mom made really good chicken, and this was the best, I took, I literally took the tray home. I'm not kidding. I took, I, I was, ex and that, that chicken got eaten. Like, a whole tray of chicken was consumed in our house. Uh, it was, it was amazing. Um, by me. That's right. None of my other family even had a single bit of it. It was just consumed by me. Um, we, we have, um, man, our, so our, our, our Latin American brothers and sisters we have in here, we've got Colombian, Dominican, uh, Cuban. Uh, those are the ones that come to me in my head represented. Um, I don't know if you've had Lisette's food. Same thing. Um, you will go to heaven, right? Like, not, she won't kill you. That's not what I mean. Like, it, the experience is transcendent. 
And so, but you notice that every single culture has this dietary, this general dietary thing, some of it connected to the geography, all that, but you can distinguish even today people's culture often by the food that they eat. Um, I remember, I remember one of my pastors um, that he, he grew up, he was a, a German Lutheran, and he referred to pizza as ethnic food, it was one of those things like for me was like, oh, that has changed a lot. Because, like, I, like, that's mine. I mean, I'm American. Like, pizza is mine. It's like, no, that's Italian, right? That's their food. Um, and so in that time frame, people were distinguished by this, but Jesus, Mark says, that he declared all foods uh, clean at this point in time. And so that enough should, should set us off. But if we go and we look at the whole structure of this, right before that, Jesus walks on water and calms a storm simultaneously. Now, um, if you've been following us through Mark, you're, you're already at a little bit of an um, advantage here. But if you're not, I, wa- I want you to, to think through these things. So you have an encounter with water, you have Jesus casting out a demon, and then him healing somebody of a dire, of a, of a big disability. If you look at Mark chapters 4 and 5, guess what you find? You find Jesus calming a storm. You see Jesus casting out a demon, and you see God, then you see him healing a woman who'd been bleeding uh, for, for 12 years and for raising a 12-year-old girl back from the dead, in that order. So if you, if you are walking through the woods um, and you encounter random stones, it might not be something that you would care about a whole lot. Like if you're walking along a mountain trail and you encounter some rocks, you might be like, oh, that's interesting, look at the moss and the rocks. But if you opened up into a clearing and you saw on the side of the mountain um, four faces of human men carved into the side of the rock, you might think that there's something here that is worth noting, something to pay attention to because you see a, a pattern. You know what a human face looks like. In Scripture, if you start seeing a pattern, recognize that that's intentional. That as Mark is writing his gospel, he likes to write things in threes. And so when you have an episode with water, um, a casting out of a demon, and then a healing happen right in a row, and then you have that happen again, Mark's trying to say something to us. The only difference, and also just happens to be in both of those passages where he had the Decapolis mentioned. The only difference between these two is that who he does the miracles to. You have, in this scenario, you have a heavy emphasis on Gentiles. You have a heavy emphasis on Gentiles. But we got even more that's going on here. If we weren't convinced yet that Mark's point in this is saying that all the promises that, are, that were promised from the beginning to all people that are coming through a Jewish Messiah are available to the Gentile nations, there's one that should put the nail in the coffin for us. And you guys are going to learn a word today. You're going to learn a word in Greek. Congratulations. I need you guys to say laleo with me. Laleo. One more time. Laleo. Okay, so I wanted you to teach that one because it's fun. Um, it's the word that means to speak. And it's nice and easy to remember because it sounds like what it means, right? La, 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 right? Ever have baby chatter, right? Like you teach them different sounds. So laleo means to speak. Well, um, there's a word used in here that um, is magalalos. Maga meaning hard. It is the word that is translated in our script oftentimes as mute, but for instance, in the ESV that's in front of you if you're following on your worship guide, it's, it's translated as speech impediment. Now again, when you're reading along in your scripture and you see something that is out of the ordinary, even in your English translation, it's a good thing to make note of. And this is a case where it's really important. There are different words in Greek that could be used to, you, to mean mute. Okay? This word happens once in the New Testament. Okay? So remember how big the New Testament is. Once. All of the words. This is the only time this word is used. Okay? That is noteworthy enough. But remember the Old Testament? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, but was translated at one point in, um, according to, um, to tradition by 70 different scribes in 70 days, and it's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. You don't need to know that, but you need to know that at one point in time, they translated the Old Testament into Greek, which is the same language as the New Testament, because a lot of people spoke Greek at that point in time. That was probably the Old Testament they used. 
I know this is getting really heady, but this is amazing. And this is one of those pieces when I read this, just causes me to worship about God's purposes here. Only this word that's used one time in the New Testament is only used one time in the Septuagint. Only one time. And guess what? It's a passage. It's purely messianic. It's Isaiah 35, 5, and 6. It's a passage that is used by Matthew and Luke as summaries of this messianic ministry. That how will you know the Messiah has come? You will know because the blind will see. You will know because the deaf will hear. And you will know because the mute will speak. It is a dearly beloved messianic passage that if you were a Jewish boy or girl, when you were thinking about your Messiah coming, especially if you had a relative who was mute or deaf or blind, you would think of this passage. This is how I know that my Messiah has come and where is Jesus doing this ministry at? Where is it being applied to? Gentiles. If you had any doubt before you came in here today that Jesus would welcome you if you came to him, Jesus will welcome you if you come to him. That for a nation looking for a Messiah, a Jewish writer, possibly a Greek Jew, writing to a Roman audience, a gospel to them to ask that question, is Jesus for you? He answers it resoundingly, yes. See, in that time frame, if you, wanted to, if you were a Gentile and you wanted to come to worship the Lord, there was an actual physical dividing wall preventing you from entering into there. And we're told in Ephesians that Jesus' role was to tear down that dividing wall. Jesus says, come to me. That's the first thing he says. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. That was 25 minutes, people. Like, it's all right. It's okay. Um, but the second thing that Jesus says is be healed. Second thing he says is be healed. So he comes to this region, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And it said, taking him aside from the crowd privately, I want you now, you can almost like just do this. Like put yourself in the zone. He puts his fingers in his ears. He spits, and the implication is he spits on his hand and touches the tongue. And in this moment, he looks up to heaven, he sighs, he sighs deeply, and says, Ephatha, be open. And his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Now, when Jesus is doing these ministries, when he's doing these miracles, the gospel writers do not record every single thing that Jesus did. They do not record every single thing that Jesus did. In fact, we, we know this because John actually says that. He says that if we were to record everything that Jesus did, there would not be enough paper on earth, there would not be enough ink to record everything that Jesus did. So that means, if we understand that passage, we use that to interpret Scripture, that when we see him record a story, there's a question. Why is that you include this one? And again, we already mentioned, like, you, you heard the detail in this. Like you have them taking him aside, even the very words that Jesus spoke, the way that he did this is all recorded for us. This is a beloved story. This is the beloved story that's happening here. But what he's also doing is he's opening up a conversation. Remember how we said that we, Mark speaks in triads and this is the second triad applied to Gentiles? Well, guess what? He's wrapping one up. At the beginning of this triad, we have the feeding of the 5,000. And then the next story that I don't have to preach is the feeding of the 4,000. So you have the feeding of the five, feeding of the four, and just happens to be this triad that we see earlier on captured in there. This is one unit. And what happens if you have a book that's in a sequence? Like you've got other books coming. At the end of the book, what do you do? You tease the next one. You've got a cliffhanger because you've got to sell that next book. Right? So the cliffhanger that's happening here is that Jesus is introducing, Mark is introducing for us to see what Jesus is doing this concept of spiritual deafness and spiritual blindness. There is a spiritual, this is a physical, actual, historical thing that happened, but it's in, for us as we look at this, we should see our own spiritual deafness and later on our own spiritual blindness in this. Now, I have also been alive in 2020, and I know that you guys know that it has been an insane year. Um, in fact, um, I probably have heard that phrase from the pulpit more than anything um, during this time. 
like to the point where it's almost one of those things that we like, oh, yeah, you're right, yeah, it has, like, we don't think about how crazy this year has been. But one of the things that I found really interesting about this is, is watching things play out in the church. So we're, we're among family here, right? So let, let's, do some, let's do some family business. Um, there is a lot of not listening happening. There's been a lot of not listening happening that I can see. And maybe, it's, maybe, it's, maybe I'm the only one that has realized that I've just been looking for people and looking for messages that fit my own narrative. But research says that I'm not the only one. When we, when we come to a, a text like this, I want you to put yourself in the state of a, again, remember that Jesus came as a Jewish Messiah to Jewish people. When they read Isaiah 35, who did they apply it to? Themselves. Fair? If I, so if I'm a, I'm a Jewish boy and a Jewish girl in a school, and I'm being taught, taught Isaiah 35, that one day Messiah is going to come, and he's going to loose the tongue of the mute, that he's going to heal the blind and heal the deaf, I'm applying that to me. Jesus is my Savior. Think about the surprise Think about the surprise that would come from Mark taking that beloved passage and now showing that he did this to Gentiles. Now, what's really great about, about this is that I can speak in a way without, any, without pushing any narrative. The reality is, is that this disrupted Israel's narrative. It interrupted them about themselves. It interrupted what the, the beliefs that they had about their own uniqueness and that God's hand uniquely placed on them. And that's what we see. And again, as I try not to preach any of the other texts. Luckily, we got, we got a month so you guys can forget all of this before you know, we preach the next section. But you have this idea that when Jesus puts the fingers in the ear and he sighs, um, he sighs a little while, one, less than a chapter later. And he sighs a sigh of exasperation and trying to have to explain to the Pharisees over and over again when they say, can you give us a sign that you're a Messiah? Again, not my text, but it's hard to ignore. Because what did Jesus just do? Signs. Sign and sign and sign and sign again. The problem was that Jesus did not fit their narrative. They were expecting a Messiah to come and overthrow Rome. Jesus came and was born in a manger. Again, like we sing that song, and just a reminder, a manger is a feed trough. You're talking the slobber of of beasts. The slobber of donkeys and cows and sheep was in that. I know Mary's a good mother. I guarantee you she laid straw down there, but it doesn't take away from the image, does it? It disrupts that narrative. They were expecting that, they were, that he was going to sit on the, the throne of David, restore their culture. Instead, Jesus comes down, and, and guess what? Before the, before the Bible even ends, before the Bible even ends, we're promised a multi-ethnic, multicultural church with people of every tribe, nation, and tongue. The narrative is disrupted. Now, I almost need to, I need to say this. It, it should be understood. I'm preaching to myself first. But my, my fear is that one of the things that we've been doing is we've been so desperate to um, to hear people affirm what our own beliefs are, that we've placed ourselves in situations where we don't want to be challenged. We don't want our narrative challenged at all. We want comfort. We want peace. But instead, Jesus calls for healing. Now, that second part of this, the healing itself is very tactile. One of the other things that I hear a lot about us this year is that we want healing. And we're not just talking physical. We're always praying for physical healing, but we're talking about the healing of a nation. We're, we're talking about the healing of families. We're talking about the healing of communities. Now I want, again, I know that this, this passage is talking specifically about a physical healing, but I need you to see the implications of this. Jesus puts the fingers, I, if I came up to you right now and I put my fingers in your ear, if this is your first time meeting me today and I came up to you and put my fingers in your ear, I'm realizing there's people to be like, that's just Eric, you know, but no, if it's my first time here, I put my fingers in your ear, how would you feel? I would feel violated, because that's my space. If I put my spit in your mouth, how would you feel? Violated. 
right? This is intimate. This is, again, and we've, we've talked about this, but man, I just can't ignore it in the passage. If we want healing, you got to be in people's, in people's space. You want healing, it has to be done in community, has to be done in intimacy, and guess what? It's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly. But do you know what the beauty of this is? Is that this, this, this passage builds on itself. We've got a dividing wall broken down. And so because of that, because we have a God who is a wall breaker, we have the ability to break walls. We have the ability to break walls. So God says, come. God says, be healed. And then God says, I am the hope. And now, um, because of, I'm looking at my time and I want to be honored and respectful to the text and to your time, I'm going to combine these next two because they combine really well. God says, I am hope. And God says, speak. Now, I know I've, I just, that last point, I just stepped on everybody's toes, including my own. Um, but I want you to think of, of this piece. So he is deaf, and it says he has a speech impediment, and that's why most people would say that he was born deaf. The reason being is because um, it's not saying that he's mute, but if you, are, if you are born deaf, 80% of deaf children are born to speaking to hearing parents. And so because of that, there's an expectation that they will learn to speak. So you have a lot of people that learn to read lips, but what have they never heard? They never heard the sound. They've never heard the sound. And so because of that, when they speak, they're, they're mimicking the lips, but, but the sounds could be garbled, right? It might, it's not going to come as clear because they've, they've never heard it. And so most likely this man, it's, that, that he has the ability to speak, but he's just never been able to, to do it in a way that would be understandable to people around him. But when his ears are opened, right, Jesus speaks at Fratha, verse 35, and his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Now, pay attention to that laleo. Everybody say laleo. What does laleo mean? It means speak. Listen to the words. Jesus spoke to them. He charged them to speak to no one. But the more he spoke to them, the more zealously they spoke about it. And all the people on the internet have no idea what just happened. Think that God just spoke there. Camera's okay, people. It's all right. Um, but you notice all these speak words, all these speak words that are here. The first thing that happens to this mute person when their tongue is released is they can't stop speaking about Jesus. Because Jesus is the hope and has just shown them, they, he has shown them that he is the hope, so much so that what do they say about him? He has done all things well. Going back to Genesis, God creates the world. It's played out in six days in the narrative, and at the end of it, what does it say? It says, everything was very good. In other words, God just did everything well. The universal gospel is being played out in front of them. They see it. It is a gospel avail available to all people who simply have to confess and believe that Jesus is who he says he is and to pledge to follow after him. It's this, they say he does all things well, and again, they, whether they know it or not, Mark knows, they speak Isaiah 35, that he makes the deaf hear and he makes the mute speak. I'm, I'm ashamed in this passage. Real talk. I, I am ashamed by this passage because how often if I had opportunity to speak and the ears that God has given me to hear people, to hear speech, and a tongue that's able to form it, and I never said it. And the first response, the first response is to glorify the Lord, is to make Jesus' name known. In fact, so much, Jesus is telling him to stop because he doesn't want people to misunderstand why he's doing these. He is doing them to show that he's the Messiah. He doesn't want to be just known as a good teacher. He, Jesus never wanted, he's telling him, don't tell people about, I don't want to be misunderstood, but they can't help it. Christian, can you not help talking about Jesus? So oftentimes, spiritual deafness and not hearing God speak also results in spiritual muteness. When I don't listen to the Lord, I just find myself in my comfortableness. 
I never push myself to be uncomfortable. I, I praise God for those of you that speak regularly. For me, it's something that I want to aspire to be. I want to have that, that willingness on the tip of my tongue that I will always be spiritually ready to proclaim the Lord. So what do we do? What do we do with this text? Well, there's a couple of things that we, that we need to call our attention to. Um, the first one is speak. <laughs> Jesus is the hope. Jesus displays himself as the hope of nations. That means he's the hope for your neighbor. That means he's the hope for your sister. That means the hope for your mother. That means he's the hope for your boss. That means he's the hope for your employee. That means he's the hope for your patient. That means he's the hope for your children. That means he's the hope of your community. Nobody is outside of his reach. But guess what? I want to, just for those of you that might have been freaked out even by the use of the word universal, just to clear everything up right here, I'm talking about availability. No person, based on where they're born or what language they speak, what tribe they associate with, and that means all kinds of different things with the 2020 political cycle, and when we look at around the world and how we use that term tribe, I'm talking about all of them. Nobody, nobody is restricted from the gospel by any of those things. But we are told that people cannot believe if they do not hear. And so you have a mute man whose tongue is loosed. He is now spiritually loosed, you could say. When you have an encounter with Jesus, it's time to tell people about it. And so here's just a real, real practical piece. So for those of you that like, I'm talking about evangelism, and it, it freaks you out a little bit. Um, if you spend time in the Word, if you spend time in your Bible or you do devotional and God is teaching you something, guess what? Start there. Talk with your, talk with your neighbor. Talk with your, your coworker. When they ask you, when they ask you what you've been doing, I've been, reading, I've been reading this book, you know? Also, if you're reading the Bible, please do not say I've been reading this book. It, like, because, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's technically true, but it, like, it, it kind of feels like a bait and switch. Like, you know, just say I'm reading the Bible. Like, and that's all right. People need to know that. Read the Bible. But you're, so whatever God is teaching you, talk to your neighbor about it. Guess what? They're going to have questions. They're gonna, you're going to have spiritual conversations. But the second thing that we need to do with this is kind of imply about that first one. We need to hear God speak. And so for, for those of you that are just not in a regular habit of reading, reading the Bible, I want to I wanna give, just to speak to three different groups. So if you are um, a brand new Christian, or maybe you have not committed your life to Christ, um, if you're at the beginning of your journey, um, I just want to implore you to start. Um, and the place that I would call you to start is actually the Gospel of Mark. That's actually usually where I would start people off. Like, read the Gospel of Mark. It's, it's short. You're going to get a picture of who God is. Um, and this is where things get weird. If you're not familiar with Scripture, again, this is, we're in Mark. So, we don't start, for some reason, the Christians, we don't start at the beginning reading our books, right? We just, we randomly start in the middle of it for some reason, right? Uh, but the reason is because each one of these is individual books. So start, start with the Gospel of Mark. And once you finish that, um, I know this is weird because you're going to see, like, I've already read this before. Read the Gospel of John because then you're going to see Jesus on display. Um, so if you're a Christian um, and, and you've, you've been a Christian for a while, but um, you've, you've gotten out of the habit, um, I, would, I would really encourage you, and this, this might come out of left field, I'm not going to tell you where in the Bible to start, I'm going to tell you where to do it, and that's to do it in community. Find somebody else that's willing to go through Scripture, and pick, and honestly, um, when Heather, this is, you guys are learning a lot about me, when Heather and I first uh, started dating, Heather was a baby Christian, our first book we studied together was the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, that's, an old, that's an Old Testament book, there's a lot of great Old Testament books, but if you don't have the gospel, like a gospel understanding, it can be confusing. And we studied it together, and, and Heather's still alive today and is, is still saying. So, um, but the important thing is do it in community. We were, we were called to do, to do this in community. Um, and the last thing, if, you are, if you're a Christian and you say, you know what, Eric, I got, I've got a good regular Bible study, um, my challenge to you is, is to invite somebody in. And so guess what? Like, there's three groups there, and you know what? Meet each other here today and walk out of here with a plan and do one of those things. You don't, we don't, you don't have to wait. Find, like, 
we can, we can do that. Um, also, if you don't have a physical Bible, I should, I should have said this a little while ago, if you don't have a physical Bible, we have one for you. It's out on the table as you go out. That is our, that's our gift to you, and we're more than happy uh, for you to have that. But as we, as we come and as we close this text, you hear God speak. You hear God speak through Mark. You see the message that he's saying, that this gospel is for everyone. Speak it. Let us go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your love for us, your tenderness for us, and your care. Lord, I, I'm always constantly amazed, Lord, at the fact that there is no restriction in my way to come to you, that you say freely, come to me, and how often I, in my sinfulness and my desire to do things my own way, I, I, I don't. Lord, start with me. Shape our hearts. Give us a passion for who you are, a passion for um, your gospel, compassion for your kingdom, Lord. Teach us to love others the way that you have loved us, and teach us, Lord, to always speak and open our mouths and glorify your name. I thank you, Lord, for who you are, and I thank you, God, for gathering us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.